Hi guys, we are on our third workshop today, our third and final soil workshop. It's been fun. I hope that you have learned a few things and I know I have learned a few things from you. I love hearing about what your difficulties are so that maybe I can help you a little bit, maybe overcome them because I absolutely would love to see everybody growing their own food. No matter where you live, no matter what your limitations might be, you definitely can grow your own food in some form. So please say hi, give me a wave, let me know where you're from if you'd like, and share with me, share with all of us, what um, what's your number one gardening woe and what inhibits you from really growing your own food. Um, I shared in the first workshop about how to find out where your soil currently is, whether you container garden, whether you have raised beds, whether you have a larger garden, whether you have a small garden, whatever the case, you can find out where your soil currently is, what its current um, situation is, what its nutrient levels are. And it's actually super easy. So go back and watch workshop number one um, for more information about soil testing, the one that I recommend, how it works. I even actually did the soil test with you guys to show you how easy it is. In workshop number two, we talked about amending your soil. Now, once you get your soil test results, the one that I love gives you very specific information, very specific suggestions, even links to products that your soil needs. And they're all natural. They're all uh, really great gardening practices that it's recommending. But what we talked about yesterday was unrelated to your specific needs of your specific soil. Yesterday's amendment was one that is fantastic for every garden. And I highly recommend you do it this fall and then again in the spring. So make sure you watch workshop number two for that amendment. That's amazing, all natural and fantastic for all soil types. Um, DC says my biggest difficulty is just space and starting. Good point to both of those. I get it. Um, we're renting. That's another obstacle, right? I've been paying, no, saying for years, I want to start a garden. Seven years later, still no garden. You know, that's how it happens. And that's why it's best to just start whatever small scale that is. It's true for every area of life, for everything that we've been doing as a family to simplify things, to go back to more real food, to get rid of processed food. Every single thing we've done, I found it's best to just start. It's just something tiny, just one thing, you know? So for you next year, if all you do is have some pots on your back deck that has a few tomato plants in it, you've started, right? And like you said, if you don't, if you wait until it's ideal, then seven years later and you're still going, here I am haven't started and I'm with you. I know I've been there about certain things. I understand, but I highly, highly recommend you take advantage of these workshops and just get started. So glad to see all of you joining. Um, Sandy says, I have a big problem growing big onions. You know, a soil test could actually help you with that. It could give you, do some Googling about what nutrients onions really require and then see what your soil test tells you and amend accordingly. Um, also rocks can inhibit that. Any kind of root vegetable I have trouble with as well because here in the Granite State of New Hampshire, we have a whole lot of rocks. You can, I've had this garden for 10 years and it is still littered with rocks and I remove rocks continually. Every time I'm in here, I'm removing rocks. <laughs> so root vegetables are hard for me. So there are some things that I just say, you know what? It's okay. I can grow subpar versions of these, but they're still what I have grown. I know everything about this food and I'm going to be happy with my smaller onions. I'm with you. I actually don't grow big onions either, but I do grow onions and I love them. And they have another benefit because they keep the rodents at bay. So I will surround my garden with onions every spring and it helps keep the chipmunks and the moles out and you know what? If I have tiny onions, it's okay. I have onions and I have a bunch of them because I put them all around the border. So there's usually more than one great benefit to so many things like that when it comes to gardening. Welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody. I wish I could say hi to each of you. Okay, keep commenting. I'll come back and look. Um, so today we're talking about, the third thing today is cover crops. This was like one of the last things for me as a gardener to understand, and I'm still working on understanding it because it's very, it has a lot of nuances and a lot of things about cover crops that I'm gonna tell you 
tend to go tandem. They work hand in hand and it tends to be, I'm going to tell you five things, for instance, that you can do to terminate your cover crops in the spring. That's like the biggest obstacle, I think. By the way, comment and let me know right now, what is your obstacle with cover crops? I would love to know, but I do think that's one. And if it's just the termination, just comment that so I know. I do think that is um, one of the I think it might be the number one question I get when I ask people, so what are your questions about cover crops? What do you do with them in the spring, right? Um, so we're gonna cover that and I'm gonna tell you five things, but here's the thing, that most of them work in tandem. It's not really five separate options. It's really a matter of choosing a couple of them that work best for you and everybody's thing that they choose might be slightly different depending on your garden, on your situation, on what you're gonna be planting in that area, what cover crops you planted, all those things. So. I'm going to do my best to simplify this, but know that one reason people don't do cover crops on a small scale, well, there's two reasons, I think. One is there just isn't enough written about it. Cover crops have been for big scale ag forever, right? But not for the backyard gardener. Nobody has explained it to us. So by the way, I'm working on that. And in fact, wait, I'm not going to get sidetracked. Number two, the second reason I think that people don't plant cover crops. See, I already forgot. My brain gets so excited about all the things I want to tell you. <laughs> I need like a um, monitor. What do you call it? When like, you know, they have the big screen over here and I can just read my prompts. Um, Cause I always forget. So two reasons that I think people don't plant cover crops is one, there just isn't enough written about it. Small backyard gardeners just aren't given information. And two, wow, I can't remember what I was going to say. Maybe it'll come to me. <laughs> so I'll go back to more about number one. I am working on the final steps of an ultimate guide to cover crops for backyard gardeners. And I'd hope to have it done before this live, but it's going to be done in the next few hours, definitely by this afternoon. So comment the word soil. I should have put that up in the description. Although don't do it until the live is over. <laughs> when the live is over, come back, comment the word soil, and I will make sure that you get my complete ultimate guide to cover crops for the backyard gardener that I have put together. It's taken me a while. I've been talking about this for a while. Today's the day, guys. Today's the day. Um, so let me just dive into what you should know about cover crops because my brain is really upset that I can't remember that other thing I was going to say. Um, first of all, how do I say this? I've broken down the kind of cover crops into three categories. Having said that, I will tell you there are thousands, maybe, maybe more than that, many, many thousands of cover crops that you could plant. So to say that they all fit into three categories is very presumptuous of me, and I don't mean to be too presumptuous, but to keep it simple, to break it down in a way that's really easy to understand, I decided I'm gonna put them into three categories. Just know that there are some out there that don't fit into these three categories, but that's okay. So first of all, we have legumes, you know, like beans and peas. And I didn't know when I started this journey that clover is actually a legume. And that's really important because that's the legume that I have found works best for me. So there are legumes and there are brassicas, which is all of your things like um, broccoli and kale and cauliflower and um, cabbage, all those things, the brassicas. And the third one is grasses. So all the wheats, all the grasses. Um, and each of those categories, I really have done a lot of breaking down and research to determine which one of those is best for certain problems that you have as a backyard gardener. And maybe some of you will share some of these problems with me now. Um, so again, there are a lot more problems in a garden and you could use some of these, you could use these cover crops to help you to some degree with all these problems I'm going to mention. But having done the research and looked into this, this is what I have narrowed it down to. If you have a nitrogen problem in your soil, which is very common, we're going to talk more about that, then legumes is going to be the best cover crop for you. If you need mulch, so if you have a ton of problem with weeds every summer, um, or if you have a ton of problem with erosion every summer because you get tons of rain or maybe your irrigation system will erode things. Unfortunately, that also means you're gonna have a nitrogen problem, but let's not go there. <laughs> um, if you have those problems and you need mulch for your garden, then grasses are gonna be possibly the best cover crop for you to plant. And thirdly, if you have 
um, soil that's really compact, which I do in a lot of areas, um, then, or, or just in general, depleted of nutrients and not specifically nitrogen, then probably brassicas might be the cover crop you should look into. So I actually have made a chart and there's more than that. Um, it's anyway, the chart shows you better what I can't really explain right this second. So that chart is in my ultimate guide to cover crops that's coming out later today. Um, and once you've decided what group of cover crops you want to plant, then you can research all the options in that group. And you can look at your growing season. You can look at your growing area, what grows best for you. Uh, the most important thing with cover crops, at least to me in my small, short window of growing season, is how quickly they grow. So that's a really big thing for me. I want it to be a cover crop that's going to mature extremely quickly. Um, also another thing, for that reason, it's really important if you live in a, a gardening zone that does have that shorter window of planting, if you wanna have effective cover crops, you need to figure out a way to have them grow as long as possible. Now, I don't want that to cut into my growing time of my food, of course. So some cover crops that I plant never really get to that mature stage that I would like, but I go ahead and plant them because at least there's some time and there's something that it is helping my soil with. The, the best mature time, by the way, is right before it starts to bloom. When you see the beautiful buds getting big and growing on your plant and the flowers you know are coming soon, that is the perfect time to terminate them. We'll talk about the five ways to do that. Um, and at that point, the plant is gonna start putting its energy and its nutrients into those flowers. So you wanna cut them down right then because you're gonna start losing nutrients in your plant at that point. But you want those nutrients, one reason we grow cover crops is you want those nutrients to go into your soil. All those nutrients the plant has been building up. So don't let it go to bloom, terminate it before that time. But that's the ideal time. Even if your cover crops never get to that stage, if they're still short, haven't even started forming a bloom or a bud, that's okay. It's still doing good things for your soil. But one thing you can do to get the best time, let me see if I move this way, you can get a better idea of what I'm doing here. As anything is done providing me food, I instantly take it out. So in sections, you can probably tell, this has been done in sections. Some things were planted oh, probably four weeks ago now. And some were planted just as soon as maybe four days ago. Um, that area, let me see if I can do this with my fan. I don't know if I can do this. Um, that, I can't, <laughs> I could never be a weatherman. <laughs> that area over in that corner, I planted, I think it was four days ago, maybe five days ago, um, because that had my cucumbers in it and they were still giving me cucumbers. So as, the plants are done, I immediately, I give myself, I try, I'm not great at this. I shouldn't act like I'm great at this. Sometimes days will go by and I'm like, shoot, I haven't done that yet. But I try to immediately, when I realize it, take those plants out, clear the area, and put on the amendment that I talked about yesterday, water that in, and then I will plant my cover crops the following day. So if you do that in sections, you're, you're getting the most food you can get from your garden, but the second that food is done producing, you're planting your cover crop. And you're going to have sections that do eventually get to maturity, hopefully, before you terminate them in the spring or before winter hits and you know they either stop growing or they die. So what are the five ways, is that what I wanna tell you next? I think so, the five ways to terminate. Let's see if Michelle's brain can remember them this morning. Um, first of all, you can literally weed whack them. If you have a large field, you can mow them, but in a garden this size or in a uh, raised bed, that's a pretty large raised bed, you could use your weed whacker. And like I said, all these things usually work in tandem. So typically that's not gonna be all that you do to terminate it in the spring. It depends on the cover crop and it depends on what you're planting there. If you're gonna be planting seeds there, that is not enough. If you're gonna be planting seedlings and they are things like tomatoes that are gonna grow upright and don't need a lot of area around them, you might be able to just weed whack it and get your seedlings in and you might have a lot of success with that. The reason it's good to leave the roots is they're still um, doing their job that we want the cover crops to do in the soil even after you've weed whacked off the top. But most people will do that in tandem with eventually turning it over. Um, 
if your plants don't get very tall and it's time to plant in the spring, you don't need to do the weed whacking. You can just turn them over. Um, some people will pull the whole cover crop out and get rid of it. I would not recommend that. That is not one of my five suggestions for terminating because then you've just lost the nutrients. Why not put those nutrients back in your soil? So you can turn the crop over and let it sit for maybe a week or two weeks and then it's probably ready for planting. Or you can do another step, the third step, in tandem with all of that, you can tarp the area. You can lay down a tarp, put down some bricks um, or cinder blocks, that kind of thing, to weigh it down and let that sit for, it depends on the temperature, it depends on your climate. It could just be three or four days. It could be up to two or three weeks if you live in New England and it's April and it's not very warm out yet. But you can tarp it to finally kill off the root if you're planting things that you will not survive if they're surrounded by the roots of whatever that cover crop was. Um, so I've told you three, I was afraid I'd forget. Crimping, they call it. It's really just um, cutting it down. It's, you can literally stomp on it or you can have a special tool that just lays it all down and then you can let it lay there. And again, just like if you're weed whacking, depending on the plants, you can literally clear an area where you're planting your seedlings and put them right in among what you've just knocked down, especially if they're grasses and you want them for mulch, right? Um, or like I said, you can do a combination, turn the roots over then or tarp it. Um, so that's four I've told you, right? I think somebody tell me is that four? <laughs> the fifth one, I hope that's four. The fifth one would be actually pretty much the same as tarping, but it's called solarizing it. And you would use a clear tarp and take advantage of the sun's warmth. If you're in New England and you have sunny days, that will help a lot since your weather is going to be colder. Um, but if you're down south and you're tarping, it really isn't necessary. But anyway, solarizing it and using a clear tarp can help speed up the termination process. So why go to all this trouble? So many reasons. As those plants and roots decay, they are giving all those nutrients that they had built up into your soil, guys. It's even better than the amendment I showed you yesterday. It's giving spark and food to the microorganisms that are in your soil. And without the healthy microorganisms, your plant is not going to be able to build nutrients in the spring that you're planting in your garden. Um, also, it's great for mulch. It's great for um, the roots of the plant will break up the dirt, give the worms more room and just aerate the soil and put more oxygen in your soil, all very important for a healthy garden. And like I said, you can have the mulch, um, the nutrients, what else is there? Um, a lack of weeds. A lot of these cover crops do amazing things to help your soil prevent weeds next garden. Who doesn't need that, right? Um, I know I'm forgetting things. There's more benefits, I'm sure. Again, make sure you get my ultimate guide to cover crops and then Michelle's brain that's forgetting things. It doesn't matter because it'll all be in there. Um, so what we're going to do now is what I promised you. We're going to plant some cover crops, but first let me see what questions you have or thoughts you have. So many of you are here. I'm so glad. It's hard to scroll through all this. Um, have a big problem. I already read that with the big onions. Yes, yes. Okay, so let me keep scrolling. I haven't tried cover crops because of early frost here in Michigan. I am with you. No, Minnesota. Sorry. I am with you. I understand, Sandy. And that's why the whole idea of as soon as something is done producing, take it out and plant some makes a huge difference here in my New England garden. And like I said, it's okay if they don't get to maturity. You're still providing so many nutrients for your soil in the spring. Um, and, and you're giving the weeds no room to grow. I love that about when it's time to come prepare my garden in the spring, there was no room for weeds to grow. It used to be that weeding was like the biggest obstacle for me to prepare my garden in April. It would take me a week or two to rid this area. And now I have three beds, not just this one. This is my original one to rid it of the weeds. But with the cover crops, it's so much faster to terminate the cover crop than to rid it of all those weeds. So there's definite, definite advantages and it does really help. Um, Rhonda says we have a terrible bindweed problem. Oh, when you have invasive weeds, that can be so difficult. But again, cover crops can really make a difference because you're, they're not allowing room for that weed to grow. And usually those kind of weeds are very productive throughout the winter. Um, it's not allowed to have any room when your soil is covered with the cover crops. Also, another benefit I have found with cover crops, I have a lot of problems with fungus in my soil. 
first of all, mustard is fungus fixing. So if I'm planting brassicas like mustard, it's helping that a little bit. But mainly, it's important to get the fungus ridden plants out of your garden as soon as you can and to totally rid your garden of them. So in years before I did cover crops, I made a huge mistake of letting those fungus ridden plants just hang out in my garden until November and it would rain and the fungus would just go down into the soil because of the rain and I had my dead plants there. But when I'm planting cover crops, I am more on the ball. I am getting those bad things out and I'm careful to remove every leaf and every bit of fungus because I'm clearing the area for cover crops. So it's made a big difference helping me fight off fungus in my garden. Um, okay, I'm going to plant some clover today. And it is a legume, remember, and a legume is nitrogen fixing. So let me show you my clover seed here. Um, here's the thing about nitrogen fixing. It's kind of confusing. It is very confusing. The plants itself, the legumes themselves, can't actually put nitrogen in your soil. But I can't get my lid off. They have an amazing symbiotic relationship with the bacteria in your soil. And that is what builds up the nitrogen. It's not actually the plant themselves. So here's my clover. This is actually mammoth clover. I had high hopes. I'm sure it won't happen in my short growing season, but I had high hopes that maybe my mammoth clover will be able to get to its full height before I terminate it in the spring, because then I also have some mulching material, which would be pretty cool. Um, so what happens is there's a bacteria, it's rhizobia, that is necessary in your soil if you wanna have good nitrogen. Maybe I should back up, why do we lose nitrogen? This is one of the biggest problems for backyard gardeners and large scale gardeners is nitrogen. It is so easy for our soil to be depleted of it, which is another good reason it's great to do a soil test often to find out where your nitrogen levels are. Things like irrigation, a lot of rain, runoff, which this garden, if you'll be able to tell in the video, it definitely has some runoff. It has a little bit of a slope to it, which can be good in some ways, but that runoff will lead to more nitrogen. All these things make the nitrogen escape the soil and return to the atmosphere. But we want nitrogen in our soil. It's one of the very important minerals or yeah, ingredients of our soil. Um, also, if you have sandy soil, which I really do in that garden bed, um, then the sand is going to keep the nitrogen from fixating in your soil. And also, this is kind of a, a weird thing that the, the more microorganisms that you have, which is good, you want them, the m less nitrogen you have. So in some ways, the healthier soil your soil is, the more problem you have as far as losing nitrogen. So you just have to realize it's a good balance and you just have to stay on top of it. And it's not hard, it really isn't. You, you give your soil the amendments that feed those microorganisms and keep them healthy, and that keeps them from depleting the nitrogen because they have their minerals from your other sources, like we put on yesterday. And also, you just make sure to keep on top of that soil test and plant the right cover crops to return the nitrogen. And it really does lead to an amazingly healthy garden. And once you get in the rhythm of cover crops, it's really kind of, dare I say it, fun. It's really kind of fun to see the patches come up and it just looks so pretty in the different shades of green. And it's good to purge the garden in sections. It makes it easier than trying to wait till the end, which is why I always put it off till November and I was freezing and I had gloves on and I was down here trying to clear my garden. <laughs> it's easier to do it in sections. Um, so the symbiotic relationship between your legume <clears throat> and the bacteria. First of all, often there is never gonna be enough of the bacteria in your soil already, if you, especially if you're having soil problems. So you want to inoculate your legume seed. So for my clover today, I'm going to show you how I inoculate it. This little bag right here, I purchased this from True Leaf Market. I will send all those details to you. If you comment soil, I'll tell you how to get this. This is rhizobia. And I'm going to add this to my clover seeds so that when I plant them, they have everything they need to start that symbiotic relationship. And here's how it works. The rhizobia is a bacteria that forms naturally in your soil and it takes the nitrogen from the atmosphere. Your plants can't do that. Your plants are taking the nitrogen from the soil, but the bacteria 
is able to pull the nitrogen from the atmosphere. It actually forms little nodules, little bumps all over the roots of your legume plants. And those little nodules are where the symbiotic relationship happens. And it's so cool how God designed all of this. Everything works in tandem and beautifully. Um, the rhizobia will give the nitrogen to the soil or to the plant. And it, the plant then in turn is busy feeding the rhizobia. So they switch what they each need and they share it. And the plant is then taking in that nitrogen that the bacteria has pulled in from the air and the plant is putting that nitrogen back in your soil. It's so cool. It gets me excited. All these little details of how it all works. So let's inoculate this. This is getting longer than I had hoped. I'm glad you guys are still with me and more of you are still joining. I'm so glad. Okay, let's do some inoculation. It's really simple. It sounds complicated, doesn't it? It sounds like you need to have a PhD or something. <laughs> it's really, really easy. Okay. I did not bring down what I needed. So right before I went live, I was already a few minutes late. I literally grabbed a wet bucket and I think this will do the job. Um, what I normally would do is I would normally get a, just a bowl from the kitchen and put enough seed in it for what I'm gonna plant. And then I would get a spray bottle and just very lightly mist the seed. You don't wanna over wet it, just enough mist that this bacteria can attach itself to the seeds. And you don't need much of this bacteria either, just a very little bit. Okay, so here's my bucket. Oh, and I just have a small area here that I prepared. I don't know, you know what, let me move this. Sorry, if this is making you kind of dizzy. <laughs> um, let me do this. Is that gonna work? Oh, I need to make this leg shorter. I really need like a, I don't know, tech support or something helping me. <laughs> No, it's not gonna work. Okay, there we go. So I've got this area ready. It's a small area. For some reason, whoa, <laughs> I'm trying not to trip over my bucket with the water in it. Um, for some reason, when I planted here, this cover crop area, I stopped too early. I was thinking I needed more walkway to get in the garden, I guess. But I'm just gonna leave a small walkway so I can get in and maintain the cover crops and water them. And then I'm going to take this triangle area and cover it with more cover crops. So to prepare it, we've already talked about this. First step, find out what it needs. Do that soil test. Second step, let me show you. I actually have it right here to show you. This is what we talked about yesterday. I did this a few days ago in this section. You just sprinkle on some of this wonderful amendment. It's all natural. It's volcanic ash and salt. It's loaded with more than 60 minerals and it will give a spark of life and feed the microorganisms in your soil to make them really strong and healthy and to go into the winter in their best state of health. Okay. And then you add your cover crops. So these are just other seeds I have in here. Okay, this is my mammoth clover. And if you can see, I have just a little bit of water in my dirty bucket. It's probably too much water, actually. Let me pour a little bit out. Okay. And I don't need much seed for this area. So I'm gonna just use a handful of seed, put it down in my water there, and it's probably too much water. The only problem with having too much water is it makes it hard to spread and scatter your seeds because they're so damp, they're sticking to your fingers. And then I just need a really tiny bit of this. I'm not talking, I'm talking minuscule because this is such a small amount of seeds. So unfortunately you're not gonna even see me putting this on. It's such a little amount. Okay. Mix it up. Oops. Yeah, it's too wet. <laughs> Michelle's um, a technique to try and, what's the word I wanna use? go with the flow and deal with what I had didn't really work. Let's see, it's too wet for me to scatter it now. I just got a whole big clump. Okay, so let's try that. Uh, hmm. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this again because I don't know. I really should have grabbed a watering can and a bowl. If I put them in this corner, I have some of the rhizobia here, I'll add to it. 
Yeah, guys, I'm not going to be able to plant this with you because I got to do it the right way. <laughs> well, maybe if I do that, if I kind of... Usually I would scatter it, but if I kind of uh, flick it, that might work. <laughs> this is how not to plant your cover crops, guys. But well, the important thing I wanted you to know is the inoculation. I didn't know that the first year. I'm trying to break up my clumps of seeds. I, um, I didn't know about inoculating the first year and I just planted my plants, which is fine. They still had some nutrients that they had when I turned them over and they still helped weeds from growing, but I didn't help with the nitrogen problem at all because I didn't give the plants the rhizobia bacteria to do that symbiotic relationship and to pull the nitrogen from the air. So there were still benefits, but I missed out on the most important one because I needed to increase my nitrogen. Okay, well, we kind of have it planted in that little section. Once you get your cover crops in, you do need to do it in sections. So you're able to rake what you just put in. If you have a large garden that you're doing this in, you can't just scatter it everywhere and you can't, because you couldn't go back to rake it without walking on the seeds you just planted. And you can see all the rocks that I was telling you about. Okay, so you just do that, that's it. Lightly rake it in and then water them. That's it. You have just successfully planted some cumber crops. Maybe successfully. <laughs> so I hope that that dispels some of the confusion. I know, like I said, us backyard gardeners don't have the resources that we need to understand this really important step that does so much good for our garden. By the way, um, I will send you the details on the best source for cover crops, my absolute favorite. They're a fantastic resource and they have so many great options in all three of those categories that I mentioned, the legumes, the grasses, and the brassicas. Um, I'll send you all that, just comment soil, and I'll get that out to you today. So I hope this was informative and I hope I've encouraged you to just get started if you haven't. And this has been fun, guys. There's three workshops total. Make sure you comment soil. I will send you links to all of the replays if you missed the first two. Have a great day.